Uh, if I'm looking in the mirror, because I want to look perfect. Are the kids all right? Chasing fame, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme, CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real, you'll have time to get prepared. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening A Senate vote is expected today on a short-term spending bill. The House passed the measure yesterday. The continued resolution we passed yesterday will ensure that government stays open through December 23rd. Here we are. This may be the last time I see you in this way. We have oversight and accountability. We have judiciary. So we're going to do that work. We'll absolutely have the, the support to, to be speaker, and he's going to be a great speaker. Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema says she's leaving the Democratic Party. There are some senators, some of uh, uh, Sinema's colleagues that are uh, encouraging me to run. Welcome to Red and Blue. I'm Robert Costa in Washington. Thanks for joining us. We begin tonight with Congress now one step closer to averting a government shutdown. The House passed a short-term spending bill yesterday that would extend funding until next Friday. Lawmakers do face a deadline tomorrow night, Friday night, to pass that extension, or they could face a partial government shutdown. The bill would give Congress more time to hammer out a roughly $1.7 trillion long-term deal. For more on this developing story, we're joined by our CBS News colleagues, Scott McFarlane and Caitlin Huey Burns. Caitlin is a CBS News political correspondent. Scott, of course, is a CBS News congressional correspondent. Caitlin, we'll begin with you up on Capitol Hill. How did this deal come together? What's your impression of where it stands? Well, lawmakers up here on Capitol Hill are pretty eager to get something done, but it depends on what chamber you're in. I'm standing on the Senate side where uh, the Senate is is further along in the negotiations because Democrats are going to control the Senate next term. Republicans on the other side of the Capitol, led by Kevin McCarthy, are urging for a shorter term bill so that they can have more leverage in the next Congress. Um, take a listen to what Patty Murray, uh, one of a, the top ranking Democrats, had to say when I talked to her earlier. I am 100% hopeful, 98% confident. It's, we have a lot of work ahead of us, and as we all know, the days are going behind us. We've got to make decisions. We need to get it in writing. We need to get it passed. And this is kind of a preview of what you may see in the next Congress, uh, a difference between Republicans in the House and Republicans on the Senate, just given where the majorities are. But if you look to next year, um, it would be very difficult for Kevin McCarthy to uh, wrangle votes around a spending deal, even as he is pushing uh, for that in the next Congress. But, Scott, does Kevin McCarthy matter in this equation? He's not yet the Speaker of the House. He's in the minority. Democrats still control Congress, seem to be moving toward a deal. It didn't even seem like Kevin McCarthy and the House Republicans were even at the negotiating table. Based on the Republicans with whom I'm speaking, they weren't part of the close-knit talks that Richard Shelby, top Republican for the Senate Appropriations Committee, that Pat Leahy, top Democrat in the Senate Appropriations Committee, and any House negotiators were on. So left out of the talks, they've been unequivocally against this deal, saying, first of all, it could fuel the deficit, and second of all, perhaps they'd be better off taking a crack at this in January or February. Caitlin, Scott brings up a point about how if the, the old bulls of the Senate, the appropriators, making this deal I I here in December of 2022, is this a preview, perhaps, of how the next Congress is going to function, narrowly divided in the House, a Democratic Senate majority, and perhaps the House Republicans are being left on the sidelines? Yeah, well, Scott brings up a good point about Shelby, and he is retiring. Uh, and so he has been kind of criticized from some Republicans on the House side for saying, you know, if you're negotiating this deal and then you're leaving, um, we have the majority next year. Let's be part of it. But it's almost kind of a political push if you think about it, right? I mean, it's easy to say um, I'm against this on the, the Republican House side. Uh, it's too much spending. Uh, let's be in, let's do it when we're in control. But when you're actually in control, it's a 
a lot more of a complicated uh, process to get enough votes to get agreement when it comes to uh, spending. So this is kind of a last chance for uh, those, you know, uh, long longer those who have been here for a while who are leaving uh, to make their mark. As Shelby has said before, um, you know, we have to fund the government, so let's fund it. Scott, you, you brought up the House Republican leader, Kevin McCarthy. What's the complaint here in terms of what's in the package from the Republicans? Well, first of all, I think the complaint is fundamentally they don't believe they were part of the talks. So they are not, they don't, they're not terribly read into what's in this deal, nor are rank and file members of the Senate, presumably. Um, that they kicked this can down the curb a week is a type of accomplishment. It doesn't feel like a Herculean accomplishment. They still have to work this out. And really, they're going to go past the deadline Mitch McConnell seemed to set over the past few days. He had said if this goes past December 22nd, which is Wednesday, they're out of any year-long continuing resolution or omnibus bill. Um, so if this goes to next Friday, I'm not sure where the chips fall, but House Republicans seem to be no part of this discussion. Speaking of House Republicans, our colleague Catherine Herridge spoke to one of them earlier today. Let's listen. Well, Kevin McCarthy become the speaker in January. Absolutely. Uh, he's a leader. Uh, he is, uh, he has proven himself, and I, I believe he will absolutely have the, the support to, to be speaker, and he's going to be a great speaker. Congressman Biggs told a radio show that he has enough quiet support that Kevin McCarthy won't be elected on the first ballot. Is the congressman a serious challenger? No, no. And, and, and um, <clears throat> the, you know, when we go into next year, it's going to be very important uh, that uh, that Congress function, and and um, Kevin is that leader who's going to be making certain that Congress functions, and we get our job done, and that we serve the American people. Well, it's got to get to 218, and there's been a lot of discussion over the last few weeks whether he can get there. Do you see a scenario where a consensus candidate could be put forward? No, I'm very confident that Kevin will be the next speaker. Caitlin, you just heard from Congressman Mike Turner. He's talking about how Congressman McCarthy is trying to put a, together a coalition to win support among House Republicans. But he's also dealing with some tension with the Senate Republican leader, Mitch McConnell, over how to handle spending deals, how to handle the Biden White House. How do you assess McCarthy as he deals with these multiple fronts of challenges? Yeah, this McConnell and McCarthy comparison is going to be very interesting to watch in the next Congress because they are going to have very different goals. McConnell is going to be operating in the minority and in the Senate where you're going to have to kind of cut some of these deals with Democrats in the majority. Uh, on the House side, McCarthy, as you've already seen, the way in which he is trying to uh, garner votes and support, he's having to make uh, deals or outreach to people like Marjorie Taylor Greene, who has essentially been helping to whip up support for him. Uh, and it's going to give some of these kind of backbenchers, some of these outliers with, within the party, more of a voice. And that's very difficult uh, to wrangle here. So that relationship between the two, which I think you're seeing when it comes to the spending bill, is something to keep an eye on in the next Congress. Kate, uh, Caitlin made some points about the next Congress. One of the issues we're going to be following in the next Congress is the expiration of the nation's borrowing limit, the debt limit deadline. Are there any lessons, Scott, from what's happening with the spending negotiations right now that will perhaps tell us a little bit about how that debt limit negotiation, whenever it happens early next year, unfolds? If this is delicate, if this is tricky, navigating the debt ceiling is going to be like three-dimensional chess. First of all, you know, we're, we're, what's going to be gone is one-party control of the U.S. Congress. And last time that happened, and last time there was a debt limit standoff, it got really messy. It got really destructive in 2011. House Republicans have already indicated they're eager to negotiate and leverage the debt ceiling for concessions from Democrats. That's dangerous. And there was all this talk, Bob, of getting this done in this lame duck Congress. House leadership, House Democratic leadership said they'd do it. Congressmen and congresswomen elect said they wanted to get it done. Haven't heard boo about it all month. Real quick, Scott, the Electoral Count Act, reforming that, you've been following it all week. Will it still be part of this spending bill whenever this deal is done? And Senator Amy Klobuchar, who runs the Senate Rules Committee and has oversight of this, very bullish. Thinks it's going to get done, thinks the votes are there, that it's going to be a key component next week. And really, a historic change, kind of an arcane law, but imperative to January 6, 2021, imperative to change it also What's to prevent the top a recurrence. Line from the ECA reform that really matters to people? You can't just have one House member and one senator objecting to stop the electoral count. You need 20% of the House and, more importantly, 20% of the Senate, which is hard to get. 
We'll leave it there. Caitlin Huey Burns and Scott McFarland, thank you so much. And with just a few weeks to go, before the House flips from blue to red, Democrats are preparing for their future in the minority. Why we'll have our eyes on both parties' leaders on the Oversight Committee. That's next. You're streaming Red and Blue, reporting across the political divide. Original CBS Reports documentary. Yoga and wellness has become a place of anti-science. Online clickbait. The algorithms feed you content based upon your own fantasy. Potentially at my peril. There's no question about it. Spreading digital disinformation. Their entire yoga studio and spiritual community got so embedded in all of the QAnon stuff that it became a sick place. Why pro-health people are fertile ground for anti-science messages. We can just go into the whole mask thing. A lot of us just believe that symbolism for silencing people. People are locked in this mindset. They've been taught to accept what the medical doctors say. No longer are you going to be willing to take any medical advice. It's a big problem that we urgently need to address. An original CBS Reports documentary streaming now. An original CBS Reports documentary. We need to put an end to this territorial status. Will statehood create a better Puerto Rico? So that we have the same quality of life that you see in the States. What do you worry about? Me living here in the future. They're giving incentives to non-Puerto Ricans to come to Puerto Rico. And extract our natural resources and take over our land. Vacation in Puerto Rico, and in exchange for that, you don't pay taxes. Why would I allow somebody who abused me for 123 years to then consume me? An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now. When weather turns extreme. States from the plains to the northeast are bracing for more than two feet of heavy snow. Every second counts. This is a monster winter storm. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real. There's a wrinkle in the forecast, the accumulating ice. Oh! You'll have time to get prepared. Take precautions before you head out. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. People from every corner of America facing challenges. Everyone is just looking for some type of connection. Just raise your hand and say, hey, I'd like to help. Coming together to find solutions. We are going to do something about it. Their stories are our stories. Welcome to Eye on America. Stream now on the free CBS News app. We are so excited. We just can't hide it. CBS mornings are, well, everything your morning should be. Let's do it! Let's go! CBS mornings, starting at 7. Stories that inform, inspire, and brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. Welcome back to Red and Blue. I'm Robert Costa. Congressional Republicans, they are already ramping up their plans for investigations of the Biden administration. But come January, how will Democrats handle that? Well, a development on that front happened this week. The steering committee, a key Democratic panel, recommended that Congressman Jamie Raskett of Maryland should serve as the top Democrat on the House Oversight and Reform Committee in the next Congress. That move could set Raskin up to be the Democrats' counter to incoming Republican Oversight Chairman James Comer. A formal vote on that role will take place next week in a Democratic caucus meeting. Joining us to discuss the outlook on Hill investigations is Ashley Etienne, a former top aide to Vice President Harris and House Speaker Nancy Pelosi. But a decade ago, before she joined the Biden White House and worked in the Obama White House, she worked for the late Maryland Congressman Elijah Cummings when he was the ranking Democrat on the House Oversight Committee. Ashley, really appreciate you being here. Thanks for having, Thanks for having a me. conversation. I think back to your experience with Congressman Cummings mm -hmm. when he was setting off against then Congress, he's still Congressman, Daryl Issa, who, who was then the chair of the House Oversight Committee. 
there was so much responsibility on, on coming shoulders at that yeah. time to, to be in the trenches for the Democrats amid Absolutely. a House Republican onslaught of investigations. Should Raskin get it, or if, even if Raskin doesn't get it, how do you believe Democrats are positioned mm -hmm. to handle incoming Chairman James Comer? So, I, you know, I'm, I really love Chairman, Ra I mean, uh, excuse me, Congressman Raskin. I mean, I think he's seasoned, he's tested, he's learned the lessons from the Russia investigation and the two impeachments. So I think he's in a position to really make impact. But to your point about the lessons learned, I think it's really important for not only Democrats, but re Republicans to take stock of 2012 when I was working for Mr. Cummings and I was the communications director there. What we learned during that time is that the politics of retribution and payback via the Oversight Committee doesn't work. It actually backfires. It backfired in 2012, if you recall. Uh, Daryl Issa threw everything he could at President Obama, from Fast and Furious to Benghazi, Solyndra, every investigation. And where they typically go wrong and have always gone wrong is they're blinded by their ambition to take down the president and his men. And that's where, and they put that ambition ahead of the facts. And so over the course of time, the facts sort of catch up and it becomes very clear and they lose credibility. What we did strategically that I think Mr. Raskin needs to do if he wins it, what we did with Mr. Cummings is we positioned him above the political fray. You, you might remember his most famous line, we're, we're better than this as a country. And so at every point, he would always try to elevate the conversation above politics and really focus more on, um, on doing oversight. And we pursued oversight that was in the interest of the American people. People. Our first investigation was uh, about um, the mortgage foreclosure crises, right? So that really gave Mr. Cummings some credibility and contrasted him very well with Dara Issa. What can a ranking member, let's say it's Raskin sure. on oversight, what can a ranking member do if you're not following this day to day? You can't issue subpoenas. They're done by the, the chairman, by the majority party. Yep. So do you really just have to be prepared to ask witnesses questions as the Democratic side? What, what can a ranking member do? So what's key is that you uh, have the ability to seek opportunity, see an opportunity when it presents itself, and take a risk. And that's what we did with Mr. Cummings every time. I give you a great example of that is when Daryl Issa was doing a hearing on women's reproductive rights and denied us the opportunity to have a witness, and Sandra Fluke was our witness. So okay. they had a panel of all men, if you remember, clergymen talking about women's reproductive rights. We opened up the hearing. Mr. The ranking member always gets the opportunity to go first. Instead, this time we yielded to Mrs. Maloney. She opened up with the line, where are all the women? Then we immediately walked out of the hearing. All the women marched out of the hearing, took the press out. It blew up. You know, three months later, uh, Obama won women by 12, 12 points, right, uh, compared to, um, to his Republican challenger. So you've got to be able to see an opportunity, wait for it, see it, and then exploit it. I wouldn't be surprised if Raskin gets it. He gives you a phone call. <laughs> he after he may it. have already given me one. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. Do you have any news to break here on Red and Blue? <laughs> no, I mean, I think, I think the, the, the difference, though, is in 12, the investigations and the oversight under Boehner was a sideshow. Now it seems like it's the main show under McCarthy. And I think he's going to have some problems. But what about inside the White House? You've worked in the Biden White House. You've worked closely with the top players. Are they ready for what's coming? Do they have a war room? You worked on the impeachment war room for the, for the Democrats. Is the Biden White House, the administration, ready for what's coming? Oh, definitely. I mean, you know, there's reports that there's, they're, uh, you know, increasing the communication staff as well as bringing in, you know, key lawyers. But also, too, and this is, I don't know if this is reported, but they're also um, placing key communicators and lawyers in agencies where they know they're going to get a lot of um, attacks, questions, inquiries, et cetera. Clearly, like DHS is going to get a lot of scrutiny. Absolutely. So they're, so they're putting key seasoned communicators in those positions that have done investigations before to sort of push back. P Speaker Pelosi, yeah. I can't let you go without talking about Speaker Pelosi. Okay. You've worked for her in the Capitol. Twice. Twice. Yeah. yeah. You've seen her this week on a bit of a farewell tour, uh, talking to reporters, a documentary about her life in the House done by her daughter, uh, premiered earlier this week. What's your own personal reflection on her legacy politically and perhaps for you? Well, you know, she's a giant. And I think she's redefined the speakership forever. 
You know, she's like any other goat where she's mastered the fundamentals and that's really her superpower. I think people don't have full appreciation for that. She's a master legislator, prodigious fundraiser. She knows her caucus. And that is what gave her the advantage in every situation when she was going up against Trump, name him. But it also enabled her to find compromise with Republican presidents, to do big pieces of legislation, climate with Bush, trade with, uh, with Trump. Right. And so so that um, so that the question there is, is can anyone replicate that? She can knows anyone, how to wield power. Can, well, that's how you wield power is, is you master the fundamentals. Right. Um, but I would say for me, it's been personally and professionally the most transformative experience I've had. It was like a master class watching tough. her up close. I, I'm told she's tough as a boss beyond tough. <laughs> <laughs> right? She doesn't spare her staff at all. But but the thing is, is, you know, you walk away, it's like pressure, you know, iron sharpening iron. You get you get better at every every aspect of the political game, right? Because you're that close to someone who's mastered every part of it. So I think it's I'm sad to see her leave. I'm happy to see her go. She seems relieved. I'm happy that she's getting the credit that she's due. You know, but within the caucus there's still whispers and concerns about whether or not someone's gonna be able to really fill her shoes. Now Hakeem Jeffries has a lot on his plate when yeah, he takes does. over as the minority leader next year. Ashley Etienne, we thank you so thank much. You, sir. Really Thanks appreciate for me. it. And lawmakers are now looking ahead to 2024, but not just who's going to be running for president. We'll dive into the stakes. Uh, what's at stake in the Senate races coming up in 2024, especially in the wake of Arizona Senator Kirsten Sinema's exit from the Democratic Party? You're streaming Red and Blue. Everybody wakes up in the morning and they are pelted with alerts that frighten them, news that agitates them. With this show, we have the time to explain what's going on. These migrants, they've been released. Explain the status that allows them to be released, to slow things down a little bit. What are the big sets of questions for China and its ambitions? Hackers are stepping up their attacks to extort victims. Let's start with easy. Who's attacking? Here's a deeper understanding of what's happening. Prime Time with John Dickerson. Stream on the free CBS News app. An original documentary from CBS reports tensions rising between a powerful country and a vital island. The supply of this technology came grinding to a halt. The world would grind to a halt. Absolutely. As Taiwan faces threats and aggression, Taiwan is on the front line, and we understand our responsibility as a democracy. We cannot fall. CBS News examines whether they can defend themselves. Putin, Ukraine, China, Taiwan, they are manifestations of the battle between autocracy and democracy. And that is a fight that we're all engaged in. Defending Taiwan, now streaming on the free CBS News app. When weather turns extreme. States from the plains to the northeast are bracing for more than two feet of heavy snow. Every second counts. This is a monster winter storm. CBS News and the Weather Channel bring you virtual weather technology so advanced, so real. There's a wrinkle in the forecast, the accumulating ice. You'll have time to get prepared. Take precautions before you head out. Feel the forecast on the CBS Evening News with Nora O'Donnell. Stories that inform. Or you can be really old at 60, and you can be really young at 85. Inspire. How do we unlock the power within ourselves to be who we want to be? And brighten your day. The best part of fame is making people feel good. Always send the people home happy. Make every day a little more like Sunday morning. Here comes the sun. Stream now on the free CBS News app. After decades in the public eye and public service, this mother-daughter duo is now talking about gutsy women. What's the gutsiest thing you've ever done? We go person to person with Secretary Hillary Rodham Clinton and Chelsea Clinton. Now streaming on the free CBS News app. 
In today's Money Watch, business analyst Jill Schlesinger is here to help. How do you even begin to make the best use of your money? If you've got a match from your employer, Ooh. don't give away that money. Dollar, dollar, Jill, y'all. CBS Mornings, starting at 7. Welcome back to Red and Blue. I'm Robert Costa. With the midterms officially behind us, it's been a long year. Lawmakers on Capitol Hill are looking ahead to 2024. 33 U.S. Senate seats are up for grabs in the next election cycle. 23 of them are currently held by Democrats or independents who caucus with the Democrats. Jessica Taylor joins us now for more. She is the Senate and governor's editor for the Great Cook Political Report. Thank you so much for joining us. As you look at this map, what do you see for 2024? Uh, headwinds for Democrats or for Republicans? Well, I think it's too early to tell what the political climate is going to be, but it's a very, very challenging map for Democrats. And I think it's a good thing for them that they added one seat, though, of course, Arizona now puts that a little bit on the bubble in our 2024 calculations because they're defending um, they're, they're defending seats in uh, West Virginia and Montana, which Trump won by double digits. Biden lost there and another incumbent, uh, Sherrod Brown in Ohio. Some of the other states that will be up, Michigan, Wisconsin, Arizona, as we mentioned, Pennsylvania, ones that have been the perpetual battleground states now for the past several cycles. So this is this is a tough map, 23 seats for uh, Democrats they're defending to just 10 for Republicans. Jessica, uh, let's listen to a clip from my interview yesterday with Congressman Ruben Gallego of Arizona. Will you talk to him before you make your decision? Probably not. He will not determine my future. Again, it's the people of Arizona, my family. Um, he is not in a position even to make decisions. He has to balance the needs of the caucus first. Uh, and uh, by the time they figure out what they, <laughs> how they're going to balance the cinema still being there and me running for office, it's going to be too late. So uh, once I make my decision, I'll go and then we'll talk to him uh, at some point if he wants to. So the congressman seems to be moving closer to a Senate bid running for the Democratic nomination in Arizona should he decide to move in that direction. I thought that clip was intriguing because he said he's not going to talk to the majority leader Chuck Schumer before he makes his decision. So it seems like he certainly will be a likely candidate for Senate come sometime early next year. Let's say Gallego runs for Senate against an independent Senator Cinema against a Republican nominee. What does that mean in Arizona? Arizona is almost evenly split between Republicans, Democrats, and independents, but we've seen these past few elections against Trump-backed candidates and Trump-like candidates specifically that those independents have broken for Democrats. And I was just diving into some of Cinema's numbers. I mean, Gallego has not made this a secret that he was thinking about primarying Cinema, and she's clearly seeing, I think, some of the same numbers. I mean, her uh, favorables among Democrats was at 9% in one poll, and against another Democrat, she would get just 17% of the vote. I mean, those are not numbers where you win a Democratic primary. And in Arizona does have a sore loser loss, so she couldn't pull sort of a Joe Lieberman in 2006, where if she loses the primary, she could run as an independent. She has to do this proactively now. Now, notably, she has not said whether she will run for re-election, but I, I always assume that an incumbent is running. And I think it's a very, it was a very narrow path for her if she's running again as a Democrat in, in that primary. And I think it's still a very narrow path if you are a, um, if she's running as an independent because she doesn't, still doesn't pull that great with independents. She pulls lower with Republicans and she's pulling even lower with Democrats. And so it's a three-way race, but the question is who would Republicans nominate in this case? Because they have nominated, they have nominated far right candidates in these past few elections. So if it's someone like a Blake Masters or a Carrie uh, Lake that is running, um, that puts the seat, uh, those Republicans may go to cinema um, in that regards, more mainstream Republicans might. And so that it's a really interesting three-way scenario. And I've been trying to find sort of a perfect example of this in the past. And the closest thing I can come up with is uh, 2010, that Florida Senate race where Charlie Crist, the incumbent governor, endorsed by the party, but when it, once it became clear that he was not going to win the primary, he decided to run as an independent. Marco Rubio ended up corralling support overall in that in that race. He almost got half of the vote. So uh, what, what Sinema is doing if she does run for re-election is unprecedented. And the big questions on my mind are exactly that. What does Chuck Schumer do? 
And do they back her? Because again, he has a fragile 5149 majority. Mm -hmm. um, if they back her and if they back Gallego or whoever the Democratic nominee does, does she sort of withdraw and say, maybe I go caucus with Republicans, even though she said she's not interested in doing that right now, things change. Many decisions for the Democrats on the horizon. Jessica Taylor, we know you'll be tracking it all. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. And that does it for us today. You can stream Red and Blue Monday to Thursday at 5 p.m. Eastern. And a reminder, if you want to watch previous episodes of this show, you can watch them anytime on our website, cbsnews.com slash red and blue. Original CBS Reports documentary. When folks on the right talk about socialism, it's a boogeyman. Socialists are always going to promise you free tuition, free healthcare, free everything, but they will never promise you freedom. I think of socialism as government control. Wealth is too concentrated at the top right now. Providing for people the things that they need is actually the world that we were supposed to live in. Socialism didn't work in Cuba, North Korea, the Soviet Union. Capitalism is the bedrock of the American dream. My daughters, one of 40,000 people a year dying from lack of health care in this country. What kind of country am I living in that we're okay with this? An original CBS Reports documentary, streaming now.